Evening, everybody. I'm Chris Preston with Idaho Two Fly. I'm very glad that you're here. Uh, this is going to be the first of a series of classes we have this year. It's our Fly Fishing 101, and we have some wonderful speakers lined up. Uh, but before we do that, I don't know if every one of you is familiar with Idaho Two Fly, who we are, and what we do. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that supports men with cancer. We're celebrating our 10th year this year. Most of us who are involved have a personal connection, either because we've had family members, parents, or have cancer ourselves. So we're very passionate about trying to help guys with cancer. The Valley has really great medical care if you happen to be a man with cancer, but they don't always do a lot for the emotional side of things. And we've realized that uh, Idaho Two Fly was started by a group of fly fishermen that said, if you got guys out of town, and away from their everyday cares and woes and really put them with a group of other guys in the same boat, it became a really good healing experience. Many guys don't like talking about their cancer experience. Um, a lot of it from the way we were raised. We're supposed to tough it out. And when all of a sudden you realize, hey, there are other guys who are going through the same experience as I am, it becomes a very positive experience. And, I've been involved with Idaho Two Fly. This will be my eighth year. I got in 2015, and it's just a very worthwhile group where we do a lot of good. The only thing you need to be to come to one of our retreats or any of our events is a man with cancer. Uh, you certainly don't have to fish. Um, but getting out of town and having our facilitated discussions ends up being a really good process, and both for the guests and for the volunteers. Uh, everything is uh, free uh, for our volunteers and our guests. We have enough donations that uh, it, our guests don't have to pay anything. So uh, it's something that if you have cancer, please get a uh, retreat application, fill it out. If you'd like to volunteer and help us, we always need help. You don't have to be a fisherman. There's plenty of things to do. Uh, without being a fisherman, but it's just a great organization. So can I borrow that for a second? So uh, this year we have really got a great uh, schedule of classes. Uh, tonight we've got John Walter, who's owner of Angler's Fly Shop. John has been a longtime supporter of Idaho Two Fly right from the very beginning. Uh, has, ad, has owned Angler's Fly Shop for, I think it's over 25 years. Um, uh, Great local fly shop. It, it, I would encourage you, we have great fly shops in the valley to patronize the fly shops as opposed to the big box stores uh, because you get a lot better service, knowledge, and information. Uh, next, we're going to have a class, one class a week for about the next uh, 10 or 11 weeks. Uh, Tonight's going to be intro to fly fishing with John. We've got Chris Girano, who has Boise uh, River Guides. He's been a local guide in the valley for quite some time, worked for Idaho Angler. Now he has his own outfit. Uh, Chris Girano is going to do, do a talk on entomology. Nate Brumley, who is sort of Mr. Dry Fly, uh, very unique dry flies and a, a different approach. He will be the, doing a class for us. The guys at Three Rivers Ranch Fly Shop, uh, Three Rivers Ranch out of Ashton, they're big supporters of Idaho Two Fly. Their guys at their uh, Eagle Shop are going to do a, a show, a class on knots. Uh, knots are really important if you're going to be a fly fisherman, if you want to land anything. Uh, a guy named Tom Governali who works with Idaho Angler, he is a hell of a fisherman. He's going to do a great presentation on still water fishing, fishing for bass, crappie, bluegill, there's lots of opportunity, and it's really a lot of fun. Being in southwest Idaho, you have opportunities to fish for so many different things. You're really lucky. Um, then uh, Jose Cari, who is a guide in the valley, he's going to do a new look at the Boise River. There are fish in the Boise River that people in other cities have to fly for hours, drive for hours once they get out to, to catch fish the way we can catch right here in town. So if you're a newbie, it's a wonderful laboratory. You can go down and fish in the river. I mean, I've caught browns to 25 inches, caught rainbows over 20. Um, if you get frustrated, you haven't driven four hours or had a long plane ride to get frustrated, you know, you can go get a beer or a cup of coffee. So we're very lucky to have the Boise River here in town. Uh, Mike McLean lives in McCall. Uh, his specialty is 
fishing the high mountain lakes, which is a wonderful place to fish. There, um, we have so many lakes, certainly in the McCall area, but throughout Idaho. Uh, some of them are managed as trophy lakes, and it's a great opportunity there. Christian Reed, at the beginning of April, is going to do a show on how to fish with mouse patterns at night for big browns. And that is crazy exciting. I've done it with Christian. It's an immense amount of fun. Uh, and that, that's going to be a very interesting one. I will do one on European nymphing. I'm known as the grumpy old Euro trash guy where I work. Uh, and I have taken it to an unhealthy level, John would tell you. Don Connor, who is a split bamboo fly rod maker, is going to do just a general talk on equipment. Uh, and then our last class is going to be out at a city park, uh, probably uh, by South Junior High School, and that's going to be on actually fly casting. The nice part about our classes this year is that Becky uh, Lombardi is filming everything for us. So uh, every Thursday, we will broadcast the class from a week before. So if you can't make it to, to a class, you can watch them on our Facebook page at your leisure, and you can watch them over and over, and we encourage you to do that, because uh, I think it would be really worthwhile. Uh, so tonight's lecture is John Walter, Angler's Fly Shop. Here he is. Enjoy it. Great job. <laughs> I have a feeling you could have kept going. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, especially for the introductory class of it. It's kind of my forte on it. Um, if you're brand new, it's great because I can say anything and get away with it. If you're not, don't call me on it. Um, you can always pick up something. I've been doing this since I was 10 years old. And, and you can always learn something. I've got uh, a good bunch of kids in the shop and, and, and Chris, and I feel like I'm kind of the weak link in the group. Uh, what they do and how many fish they catch and where they get to go uh, rivals what I'm doing right now. So you can always pick up stuff no matter how many years you've been doing this. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll kind of go through the whole element of it. My goal for you tonight is pretty simple. I just want to give you kind of an overall view of, hey guys, this is what fly fishing is about. This is the kinds of conversations we have in the shop every day. There are times, am I supposed to stand still, Becky? Am I good? I don't want to stand still. <laughs> The one person I do not want to piss off in this room is her. <laughs> She'll have me in a clown outfit on, on TV next week. Lost train of thought. You threw me off. Gosh. Step back just a quick moment then. Um, where the hell was I? Conversations you have in the shop. Everybody. Conversations. Thank you, David. I know what's why we do, we have conversations about this exact topic every day in the shop. And it really comes down to two things. Where am I going and what am I using? We have to get our minds in the right kind of frame so that we have an understanding about the information that we can gain from others and then be able to apply that when we're on the, on the water. Our goal is to get a lot of that stuff done ahead of time so that when you get down to these areas to fish, you already have a kind of a game plan to go with. And as the events, as Chris had mentioned, and all the, the, the speakers are going to be coming in, they are going to take parts of what I'm talking about today, or what we are going to talk about today, and to apply that for wherever their, their topic is. There's a lot to this sport, but at the same time, it's a relatively simple game, right? It's not that complicated. There's just lots of little variables. And you don't have to know it all. Because you can't. You can't. You're certainly at the beginning. You can't do it. But having the resources to get some of that information will make a huge difference as you get started with this. So utilize us for that. All right. So three parts of fly fishing. This is my daughter, Madeline. She's getting married in June. It seems like yesterday. I cannot believe that. Uh, world's worst angler. I mean, God, she was bad. She goes from time to time. It usually has to be an adventure. The only reason she landed that fish is because she wasn't looking at her fly. <laughs> I know, I know, and she's going to love it. <laughs> and she'll comment on it, too. Now she's an English teacher in, in Helena, Montana. There's three basic parts to fly fishing that you're going to have to do. Some you have to do. 
that is your job. The other parts of it is kind of the lifetime expectancy of, or the experience of what fly fishing is all about. And you can, you can build on that knowledge as you go through it. But the first thing you're gonna to have to learn how to do, and if I said, hey, close your eyes and tell me what the first thing comes to mind when I say fly fishing, it would be standing in the middle of the river, waving the stick back and forth in the air, right? But the best movie I ever saw. Believe it or not, that's the last movie I saw in a movie theater. I'm not much of a movie goer, but that was fantastic. I had fished many of those places. I was going to school at the time in Helena, Montana, and I was on the edge of my seat as I was watching these different places. Like, I've been there. I know where that's at. Fantastic area. You have to be able to learn how to cast. The last part of this, uh, this 101 thing will be grouped up. They, they brought me out again to do that, and I'll teach you how to do that. But this is your job. You have to do it. You have to be able to get that fly from where you're standing to where that fly is going to land, where those fish are going to be at. But that's only the first part of it. And you don't have to be good at it. A, a, a friend of mine who I fished with for years, 20 years fishing with him, he was the world's worst caster. Oh my God, he looked like he was having a seizure out there half the time. I bought a hard helmet. And I swear to God, I bought a hard helmet for the drift boat because I got tired of getting slapped in the side of the head with his flies. Horrible caster. But what he lacked in his ability to, to make it look good, on a whim and a prairie, he was able to get it to where it needed to be. But then the second part of it that really is the magic to it is being able to control that fly, and this is a lot easier said than done, being able to control that fly so that it's, it doesn't act like it's attached to anything. And that's what you're being judged on. So the two parts of casting is going to be, okay, can you get the fly to where it needs to be? And these are accurate tools from 40 feet away, you'll be able to drop it in a small bucket. It's actually pretty easy. A little bit of time on that, no problem. But then the second part of it's going to be able to manage the line accordingly so that you're able to create the kind of drift you're looking for. And when you're casting across the river, slightly upstream, maybe a little bit downstream, you're going to have some slack in the line. And when you work with your, with your, if you go on any of these retreats and you work with a fishing buddy or if you go with a guide or you go with a friend, you're going to hear this term and it's just going to rattle in your ear. It's going to be all day. They're going to say mend, mend, mend the line, control the line when it's on the water, mend the fly line. And that's going to be something that's going to take a little bit of time getting used to, being able to manipulate that line on the current so that you're able to create the kind of drift you're looking for. And if you can do that, success. The beautiful thing about this is that you may not hit your target the first time. The beautiful thing about this is you may not be able to mend that fly perfectly the first time you make that first cast over that fish. But this is in golf. This is fly fishing, so you can make another cast up there. You can spend as much time you, as you need working that water efficiently so that you can get the kind of drift you're looking for. And in time, the more you do it, the easier it will become. All right? This is your job. We can give you lessons. You can work with friends. You can go out and practice. All good. The more time you spend behind that fly rod, the easier it's going to become. But this is something that I can't do for you. You have to do for yourself, right? And the more time you put into it, the easier it becomes. Piece of cake, right? Learning to cast. Can you see okay? The presentation of the, of the fly itself on the water, we're looking for that natural drift in still water applications. And when Tom Governale does his topic on still water, and it's gonna be a wonderful presentation, he does a great job. You're gonna learn how to maybe bring that fly in, stripping that fly in so that it actually moves. Swim that fly through it. In rivers, a lot of times we're looking for just a natural drift, the fly completely at the whim of the current it's sitting on. In the still water applications, you're going to end up putting to retrieve that fly back, put some movement to it. If you throw a lot of streamers, when you get into Christian's discussion on mousing at night, really cool thing to do. You can do that on the Boise River in town if you want to. Nothing like it, being pitch black, you have no idea where you're at, it's a little bit eerie, and then you're throwing out flies time and time again, and then all of a sudden there's just this an attack, vicious, nothing subtle about it. A little startling a little bit. You're going to be presenting those flies and streamers where you're moving that fly back in, in and then making another cast out and throwing it in and retrieving it again. So the presentations are going to be the first part you're going to really have to work about. The second part of fly fishing is understanding trout. Now we live in Idaho. We do. We live in Idaho. We have the most number of river miles in any other state in the lower 48, which is fantastic. We have rivers everywhere. 
We have trout in most of all of our rivers too, so we might as well talk about those two. But I'm not limited to just trout. I love to catch bass. Oh my gosh, the season's another month and a half, I'll be thinking bass fishing. I love catching those things, they're fun, right? We catch crappie, we catch bluegill, we catch carp. Carp. You know, if we were in England, game fish. They love carp in Europe. Incredibly challenging fish to catch. Not much to look at. If you drink enough tequila, they look okay, right? Places where we do fish for maybe not be the most stunning parts of the Idaho either, but the tequila will help with that as well. But we're going to talk about trout and, and trout habitat first, but you can apply the same thought process to whatever. If you decide to go down and catch bonefish in the, in the Keys or tarpon or, or travel halfway around the world to find golden, uh, golden Dorado, whatever, whatever species of fish you're looking for, you have to apply the same kind of thought process to it, understanding their instincts and knowing their, and knowing their environment. And if you can do that, you'll have an easier time finding them. And, and I don't know, this might come as a huge shock, but I've, I've discovered if I find fish, my chances of catching them go way up, right? I don't think that's, the jokes don't get any better, guys. I mean, this is all I got for you. All right, so the anatomy of a trout. Let's talk about this really quick. You thought science, here we go. More or less what we want to do is understand their, how they view, how they sense their world around them so that we have an opportunity of not only sneaking up on them but being able to take advantage of that. Trout have an incredible sense of smell. The steel, these are kissing cousins to steelhead. Steelhead leave our waters, travel downstream 450, 600 miles, enter the ocean, spend a year or two out in the ocean, and then smell their way back to the waters that they were reared in. Incredible to me. My, my wife's been on me for years to because I come home and I just look like I've been torched by the sun. So I got to put on sunscreen. If she's good for one coating, that's all, and I'm not going to forget about it. But one coating, and she always has that stuff that has a little bit of scent in it. So you know, you get down to the water and you put all that stuff on, and then you grab your fly, and then you handle your fly with all of that. Not good. I mean, coconut flavored caddis isn't the thing that they like to eat. Right? So be a little sensitive to that. Maybe go down to the water before you handle the fly. Reach down, grab some of that sand, wet sand, and get that, get that scent off the palm of your hands. Then you can handle your flies. When we want to enter the water, gosh, fish are incredibly aware of the environment they're in, acutely aware of where they're at. And anything that enters their water, they're aware of it. Trust me, they're aware of it. This lateral line across the side of the fish Boy, when you make that first step into the water, you've just sent out a shock wave. And whether it's upstream or downstream, it's going to get there. And they know immediately something has entered into their area. And from a fair distance away. So when we enter the water, do we just go charging in and making all sorts of commotions? No. No, we don't want to do that. We want to move very slowly, taking our time, and then maybe taking a few moments when we get into a place just to let things settle down. Beautiful thing about trout, they don't have very much, they don't have very long memory. So as long as you settle back down, we're going to be in good shape. But you want to move in the vi environment very quietly. Speaking, we have, I've had many questions on this. Fish can't hear, right? No ears. Vibrations hitting, no, probably not with the voice. But if you're loud outside the water, you're going to be loud in the water. So it's kind of a quiet sport too. Keep your voice down, move slowly and you'll have an easier time sneaking up on these guys. And we're not all very good casters yet, so we got to get pretty close to them, too. So, again, the jokes aren't very good, but we want to take our time working through and getting into the water in a manner which makes it easy for them not to spook them. All right? So, uh, lateral line, um, their eyesight. Um, this is really what we're taking full advantage of. We want them to see our fly we want them to be able to recognize um, uh, what we're offering them as a food source, but that we don't want them to see us either. And so we have to approach typically from behind. Most of the time, fish are specific, these trout are specifically built for rivers. They're a torpedo shape. They're designed to be in rivers. And if you think about it, they have to spend their entire life facing upstream. So they're very efficient at being able to do that. They have one blind spot and that's from behind them. 
So whenever you're working fish, especially if they're close to the surface, if they're rising at all, you want to spend your time working up towards them upstream as opposed to downstream. Now there's going to be some advantages maybe getting into positions where you can cast across from them or slightly downstream to them, but you still want to take advantage if you're not quite sure where they're at, moving upstream so that you can work the water in an effective way in which you're not going to be able to see. I think I've got a little fo uh, another photo of that as well that I can give you some other insights to it. Um, the last little tidbit that I'm going to, I'm going to mention has to do with uh, the slime on the outside of their of their, uh, their body. That slime is a mucus and it's designed, that's their immune system more or less. Fly fishing, we have a tendency of practice a lot of catch and release. I'm good with that. You're gonna be so good at being able to catch fish, you're not gonna be able to eat them all anyways. You might as well start letting some of them go. I don't wanna leave you with any impression that it's wrong to harvest a few fish from time to time. There's nothing wrong with that. I love to catch brook trout, I love to eat brook trout. I know fishing games trying to eradicate them. There's plenty of places where I've been trying to grow some bigger brook trout, so we've been harvesting quite a few of them out of there. Um, and if you want those spots, I can certainly give them to you. But um, when you're handling fish to catch and release, we have to be a little bit sensitive to that, to that immune system. So we want to get our hands wet before we handle fish. We want to use nets that are going to be a little bit more, or a little easier on that. If you remove that slime, or you remove some of the scales, they'll have an easier, they'll, they'll catch viruses, just like we do, and we'll end up losing some of those. And we can actually see some of the scar marks that take place on some of our waterways that fish have been handled poorly. Um, hero shots, we've talked about that a little bit in the shop as well. There's a real push right now not to lift that photograph up and, and take a picture of it, but uh, boy, I wanna see those fish, right? So you may not take a fish of every, picture of every fish you catch, but if it's your first one or if it's a memorable one, feel real comfortable getting that hero shot. Try to get the cameraman settled and set first and then you can kind of just pick him up, smile, make sure you smile for the camera. So many times I see this deer in the headlight look, All right? There was this huge brown caught at, God bless it, world record, White River in Arkansas. That's where all the big browns have been catching, coming from. I don't know how big it was, 30 some pounds. You see a picture of that, Chris? Massive fish. The guy he was with, thumbs up, big smile, jazz for him. The guy holding the fish caught it, just deer it. <laughs> Remember, put a smile on, right? If you're sensitive about where you're fishing and you don't want anybody to find that spot, you may want to black out the background or be sensitive to that if there's a bridge or some kind of feature. The guys in the shop, when people come in and they're showing pictures, they're not looking at the fish, they're looking at the background. And the next thing you know, they're online trying to figure out where those guys are at. So anyway, that's another element to it that you have to be sensitive to that. Uh, adipose fins come up from time to time as well. We're, you know, we're getting ready for a, a great steelhead run. And maybe you have an opportunity to go up to, to uh, some of our, our waterways and salmon and clear water. That adipose fin, the fishing game will remove that. It's not necessary, and that's a way of indicating if it's a hatchery fish or if it's a wild fish. So if you want to harvest a steelhead, you'll want to harvest the ones that have that missing adipose fin. If you keep one with that adipose fin, it's a nice big find if you get caught. Okay? Anatomy of a trout. Trout habitat. It looks like I don't have that other thing of the, the site, so I'm going to touch on this really quick. I thought I had one more slide in there. The eyesight itself also, trout, trout have an ability to see outside the watery world, and we refer to that as their window. Everything that's in front of or slightly behind that window, what they're going to see is a reflection of what's under the water. The window mirror theory, if you will. I've asked many people this, and nobody ever asks, answers me. I'm not sure if they've ever done it, but if you've ever been in a swimming pool and you've You've gone down to the bottom and you've, you've plugged your nose and you look up, you'll, you can see that as well. Directly right over above you, you'll be able to see outside the water. It'll be distorted depending on how deep you go and how many waves are on the surface, but you'll still be able to see outside the water. Everything to the sides are going to be reflections of that. The deeper down fish go, the more they're able to see. It's a cone of vision. So the deeper down they go, the more that wind, the more they're going to be able to see outside the water. Yep. As they get closer to the surface, they get to see clearer, but they're going to see less of it. 
And I think this is something that comes into play when you see fish rising on the surface. How we approach them is entirely different from the way we approach fish that are on the bottom. When they're on the bottom, they are in their element. And it's difficult to appreciate this, but there are times when I've worked waterways and I've literally seen fish right off my rod tip. They're right on the bottom and they really could care less about me. I've been on the South Fork of the Boise many times fishing in the, in the winter months where you just spend a lot of time nymphing. You gotta be real thorough about how you do that. And I'll look down at my feet and I'll have white fish at my feet. They're using me as a current break. I am a rock, right? And I'll mess with them a little bit where I'll step back sometimes and just, and they'll just line up. And then sometimes you want to fish for them, but it's a hard cast. You know, yeah. quite sure you do that, but anyway, when they're on the bottom, they're extremely comfortable in their area. And I think the instincts tells them that as well, right? I mean, fish can't, birds of prey can't get to them very easily, but as soon as they come up to the surface, it's an entirely different gig. So how you approach rising fish are going to be much more sensitive to their, uh, to their environment than they, they were if they're on the bottom. All right? And that all has to do with eyesight as well. There was a number of years ago, I was fishing the, the South Fork of the Boise. I spent a lot of time down on the South Fork. It's one of my favorite fisheries. And I'm working up this, this gravel, this, this uh, boulder run, and just kind of picking my way through and all these little seams and, and little areas where fish might be holding. And, and I walk around this little bush and this fish comes off the bottom and, and just takes this mayfly right off the surface. It, 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 was, it was from here to the camera. It was right off my rod tip. And I was really being careful walking up, so he had no clue I was there. God, I, I just I remember this fish so vividly. I wish I was there right now. And, he, and I watched him for about 10 minutes. And he, it was a pink Albert hatch. You're going to learn how to, all these mayflies and stuff next week with Chris Toronto, but we'll touch on it today. And every little mayfly that came over, he'd just come up off the bottom and take it and go down and oh, there's one over there and grab it. And I watched him for about 10 minutes before I finally put my, my cast in there. And I just watched him come right off the bottom and suck mine right off the... And if that doesn't do for it, guys, I don't know. I mean, there's golf, there's tennis, there's bocce ball, whatever. I mean, th th to me, that's the essence of the whole thing is being able to understand that dynamics that take place with it. All caused by just walking upstream and taking advantage of it. Okay, so trout and trout habitat. This is going to be the second part of this. Understanding a lot about where to find fish. I'd like to tell you that fish use the rivers, the river corridor equally, but they don't. They're looking for very specific places where they want to rest, where they want to hold, where they want to find a feeding lane. And there's a lot of that river that really isn't all that productive. Have we all walked the green belt on the Boise River? Yeah, everybody's done that. And we've all walked across the bridges. Who here hasn't looked over to see if there's any fish? Right, everybody does that. You ever see any fish? No, no. The Boise River, there's no fish, right? You can tell that by just looking over the bridges. No, it's a fantastic fishery. It's just what Chris was mentioning. It's a spectacular fishery. If you took the Boise River just the way it is, you just picked it up and you moved it to the east coast, all the floaters with them, because I'm tired of seeing the float. No, all the floaters with them. People would go all over the east coast to go fish the Boise River. It's in our backyard. The largest brown trout that I know of that's been caught in this area was in the Boise River. It was in 1991, and in this group, maybe not you, that wasn't that long ago, right? That was yesterday. Right, Becky? No, not a chance. Yeah, half an hour ago. All right. It was a 23-pound brown trout. Well, that must have been down by Star, somewhere way away from here. No, it was right in the heart of town. He caught it just upstream of, of, the, of the bridge that that connects Boise State and, and Julie Davis Park. He saw it from the bridge. It was a big female in there. Phenomenal fish. Freaked him out. He never fished again. That wouldn't happen to me, Dave. I would <laughs> I'd be back there trying to find anybody else, all of his relatives. That's a big fish. Boise River in town. Well, why don't we see those? They don't want to be seen. And so when it comes to this part of it, learning how to read the water in a manner that allows you to determine where fish may be is going to allow you to get into those opportunities a little quicker. 
I should have been dead a long time ago. I should have. Because when I get on the road and I start driving up the middle fork of the Boise, I'm never looking at the road. I'm always looking at the river. I'm reading the water and I'm doing 35 miles down the road. Nobody else should be alive because nobody's paying attention. There should be accidents all over these riverways. You can spot, you can take a, a, a satellite photograph, zoom in on rivers. I do this all the time in the shop. Any place that's brand new, and I'll zoom in on a river, and I'll just literally walk my way up and down that through a satellite image. And you'll be able to go, oh, God, that's a good run. That's a good spot. I want to make sure I'm there. So just little clues will help you decipher where you should find fish. And there's just a few of them that we're going to go through. So all of these places are within a couple hour, hour and a half drive of Boise, the middle fork of the Boise, the Hawaii River, South Fork. That's a middle fork fish. They do get chunky up on the middle fork. I love the middle fork. God, I hate the road. Everybody been up to middle fork before? Drive up to Arrow Rock Road. It's a tough road around Arrow Rock Reservoir. We have a handful of guys in the shop that refer to that as their five-year fishery. It takes them five years to forget how bad that road is. I like to think of the Middle Fork as a little slice of heaven. And in order to, go, to get to heaven, you've got to go through the Middle Fork Road. Right? It is. It's just horrible. It's just, Atlanta last year finally said, I think it was during COVID because everybody was out camping. Atlanta, there's this little community on the very up part. I mean, there were, what, 20 people there? And they finally said, enough. This road is so bad. You've got to grade it more than once a year. So they started doing it twice a year. It's like a freeway. Anyway, all within an hour and a half drive. God, we are so lucky to live where we live. I mean, this, it's pretty incredible. Let's talk about some of the different types of rivers. Just give you an overview of it. Uh, Boise River, is that the only topic we've got? Is the Boise River from Jose? Okay, so this, this will fit one of them. But uh, no matter what, and then Christian's going to talk mousing, so I know he's going to talk uh, Silver Creek. And that's a different type of river. So we've got a handful of types of rivers. This is, a, this is in Montana. This is uh, in Livingston. I spent a lot of time up there when I should have been studying fishing. Um, that, my parents made a wrong choice sending me to Montana to go to school. Um, maybe a right choice. So there's three different types of, of, of rivers that you're going to find in, 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 in this area. Spring Creeks is the first one, and we've got the, a world-famous Spring Creek, two and a half hours away from where we stand. And you can make it under two hours if you're late for the hatch. Every police officer understands that. Just drive real fast. I've made it under two. Probably shouldn't do that. This is a world-famous fi world fishery. World-famous fishery. I've seen license plates from New York and Vermont there that have driven over to fish that. Um, one year I was over there, and I saw a license plate from Hawaii. Uh, apparently somebody from Sun Valley didn't want to have to rent a car. Um, yeah, another bad joke there, but anyway, Spring Creeks. Great places to go fish. Gin clear water, very technical fishing. But you only need a little chunk of water. In fact, one of the videos coming in will show this. But if you look at this photograph, this was taken up at the Conservancy. There's one, two, three, four guys standing. And where this guy is at here, there's 55 fish in this run alone. He never has to move. And every one of those fish will ignore your fly all day long. So you have plenty of opportunities to get frustrated right there. So you don't need a large area of these. Spring creeks are great places to go early season. And we don't have that many pure spring creeks in this area, but this one is definitely worth noting for as close as it is. Another style of river, and this is what makes up the bulk of the riverways that we have in Idaho, are freestone rivers. And these riverways, freestone, freestone. These riverways change a lot. Freestones, there's going to be a lot of movement around to those things. And what you're going to find in your freestone rivers is, um, is the snow melt, depending on runoff. Hopefully this year is going to be a good one, right? So far, so good. We could use a little bit more snow. We need to fill these reservoirs up. Um, that heavy, those heavy flows will affect how this fishes throughout the course of the year. When it's really high and swollen and chocolate, we're not on those waters. There's going to be a definite season when we need to be on there. And this is one of the topics that we have in the shop a ton. Understanding the waters that you're going to and what those flows are like so that when you go, you have an opportunity of fishing. Sometimes it's not good. Other times they are good. 
and it all based on how much water is coming down and what those temperatures are going to be like. So you're going to see a lot of fluctuations on our freestone rivers. And then the last type of waterway that you're going to hear about are tailwaters. And this is a cross between a, a spring creek and a, and, a, and, a, and a freestone, really, and it's man-made. This is Anderson Ranch Dam. We built a big dam there. It's 300 feet tall. They're going to expand it. They're actually going to set it up another seven feet. And by doing seven feet, they're going to increase the storage capacity by 10%, which is phenomenally to me. And I think there's even discussions of bringing it up even a little bit further. The idea behind a spring creek is that those temperatures are, those flows are regulated in a manner which is very consistent. And consistent flows create a consistent environment for those fish to be able to hold in. We have two wonderful tailwater fisheries close to Boise. The South Fork of the Boise is one, and then the Hawaii River in Oregon is another one. We're all kind of hoping that we get the Greater Idaho Initiative taking place so we don't have to buy that Oregon license. Yeah, I mean, Kelly, I would be good if they just did it to the Hawaii Reservoir, but, but I mean, if we have to take it all, we'll take it all. But, you know, that Oregon license is a little bit formidable, but, but spend, that, spend that money because it's an incredible fishery and it's actually starting to fish right now. Um, these tailwaters are going to be places where you're going to hear a lot about as well. The Boise River in town is a tailwater. We have three reservoirs that sit around, sit upstream from us, and that's what creates that environment. And the flows are very regulated, the temperature is very consistent, and that's why we have such great fishing opportunities. Three types of rivers. Why we bring this up? Why do I bring this into an introductory class? Because this will determine when you start looking at places to go fishing, why we're sending you there and where you should start looking for places to go yourself, right? All of these will have a factor on how well these places are going to fish and at the time that you should go and fish these places. The South Fork right now below the dam, great time to go fish it, absolutely. Upstream, where it's a freestone river, it's probably the worst time to go fish it. And the difference being is that temperature coming below that dam is a consistent 44 degrees. The temperature above the reservoir where it's coming in, geez, I mean, how cold was it last night, right? I mean, that's, that temperature is right there at 31 degrees. Those fish are very dormant. They're, very, they're not very active, and it's very uh, cold conditions. So you want to find warmer water, and that's one of the reasons we look for areas along those lines. That makes sense? Topics every day in the shop. Stuff that you're going to have to rattle around in your brain. Things that you have to think about. And again, this has, this part of the, this part of the, the, the element is, is understanding where I should fish. From the macro, looking at whether I'm gonna to go to a high mountain lake, probably not the best time to do it right now. Whether I'm gonna to go to a spring creek, whether I'm gonna to go to a freestone river. And then when you get to those areas, then being able to read the water effectively so that you know where to fish it at. This is my friend Todd. Todd was the world's worst caster. Todd also was like a bull in a china cabinet. He let the fish know he was coming for them. When he walked in the water, he let everybody know he was coming for them. He caught a lot of fish, though. And I wish I took a video of this because it was so telling at the time. We had just worked up this run. I got on this top bowler, and I was just watching him fish. He beat me to the spot. And he beelined it to this area. Knew I was going to aim for that area. And he just literally crushed right across the water and stopped right there. Didn't fish any of this stuff. Didn't even look at it, didn't throw a cast, didn't bother with it. He walked right across and he stopped right there. And he fished this slot and from the top of this down to about, even with this boulder, he hooked five fish. Everything that was in this area were in that slot. And this is difficult to see from the photograph. He was waist level, he's up to about his knee where he's standing. This is all relatively shallow water. This is relatively shallow water here. These boulders up above created a depression down below and a trough. And it dropped the depth about two or three feet, and it slowed the current down. 
So any fish in this area, thinking about having to swim upstream all day, found areas of refuge right here. They were deep enough where nothing up above was gonna mess with them. There was enough disturbance. Anything that they could feed on was being swept down to them. This was their home. If we can train our eye to look for those types of areas from the beginning, like Todd, we'll ignore the unproductive water, focus right in on the other, right? That's the key to this game, finding where fish are at and getting to their depth. We're just gonna do a real brief run of this stuff so you just have some terminology. And we'll probably, we all know what a riffle is, right? Have we heard that term before? A riffle and a run and a pool in some of these areas? There are some other things going on that we kind of talk about and what we look for. When we think of a riffle, we're looking at relatively shallow water that's bubbly. Sometimes those riffles could be no more than six to eight inches deep. Any fish gonna be holding in that? Unlikely, unlikely. But it's incredibly important. It does two things for a river. It's the oxygen producer. All of that turbulence on the surface is mixing up oxygen into the water. So any of those fish resting down below it have plenty, th plenty of oxygen to breathe. It's also the bug factory. If you start flipping rocks and you start looking at the insects, the food source that these fish feed on, you're going to find a higher concentration of insects in riffles than you will at other parts of the river. So it's an important part of the whole ecosystem, even though the fish may not be utilizing it. If you can identify a riffle for what it looks like from shoreline to shoreline, relatively flat, or excuse me, relatively consistent from shoreline to shoreline, relatively shallow, great places to cross if you need to, then directly below that, you're gonna find what we call a run. And this is where fish spend most of their time. This is the top of the water, this is the, this is the bottom. This is a riffle. It starts bouncing down, and you'll see a little bit of a gradient if you're down below that. It'll start bouncing down, a little bit of turbidity. And then it's gonna to come to a run, and the bottom's gonna fall out. And when that bottom falls out, now we're gonna find ourselves with some different speeds and currents. Where this guy is standing, this is flat water. This is stagnant, there's nothing. It's not moving at all. He's probably in sand. But if you come out 10 feet from them, you can see the fast current coming through here. Where the fast current and the slow current meet is what we refer to as a seam. And seams attract fish, it's the right speed. And if you can identify where those seams are at, that's where you should start working your flies. All right. You can see a run very clearly and just start, when you're driving around the Boise, Boise and you're down along the river, if you walk the river, you can start to see those runs. They just stand right out for you, right? Easy runs to see where fast water and slow water meet. There's your seam. The depth is going to fall out, and that's where fish are going to be holding at. Your riffles are going to be relatively shallow. Riffle runs, riffle runs, riffle runs. That's typically the way it goes. We occasionally get into some pools where it's deep, slow water. We're not going to worry too much about that. This is where the magic takes place. In still water habitat, and I'm going to let um, Tom do more of this than certainly I am, but one of the things that I think about still water, and I like this photograph, th this first slide. When you think about still water for trout, look at how beefy these fish are, right? A little more mass to them. Look at those rainbow fish, that were those rainbows we catch out of the rivers. They're, they're a little more slender. They've had to work for it a little bit more. Not these stillwater fish. You get into an area that has an abundant food source for them, and all they have to do is just lounge around and feed and get big. I like stillwater opportunities, right? And that, that's coming up right around the corner. We're going to be down at Duck Rally Reservation, Reservation before we know it, and that's where some of these photos came from. Big, nasty fish. It's a wonderful thing. In still water applications, finding and reading water becomes a little bit tricky. You know what takes, the, takes the, the, the real mystery out of it is called a fish finder. I used to thought it was cheating, but uh, I kind of found out that it's a pretty good source of information there. So I've got one. I would encourage you to get one too if you're gonna do this. 
but you can look at some clues as well. And feed, weed, li weed lines and drop-offs are, are real good indications where fish like to mingle back and forth. Think about trout in still water like a great white shark looking for a seal. They're gonna find areas where there's a high concentration of their food. They're gonna kind of move slowly and in an ambush go up and feed them. So any of these drop-offs, shoals, weed lines are gonna have an opportunity for fish to kind of congregate in on. Tom Governale is gonna fill in a lot of this with, um, with his discussions on areas to fish, although it's gonna be heavily vested probably in this warm water game of crappie and bluegill and bass, but uh, he still knows a ton. And then on the river aspects, when you talk to, when Jose gives us talk, he'll fill in a lot of that, those other aspects on reading water in places to fish as well, all right? But those are things that we look at in the still water applications. All right, so the, the, the first topic of conversation is being able to get our fly to where fish are at. The second topic of conversation is really where should I cast my fly? The, the third part of it is, is, is what, what we use. And, and, and this, is really what, this is really what defines what fly fishing is all about. I get really excited about this topic we get a little bit nerdy, a little bit geeky when we start talking about insects. We become entomologists, that's next week's class. But I relate the insects themselves to the experience of, 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 of my opportunities of catching fish. And so it, it really blends itself very into it where you get interested. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna really get interested in what this is. This shot was taken on the Hawaii River. This was about an 18, 19 inch big brown trout and he was sticking his beak out of the water, sucking down something called a mahogany dun. And it's, it's a far away and it's a little blurry, but that's a, that's a mahogany dun right there. And there's a mahogany dun right there. And then there's another mahogany dun over here. And this is an area about this big. And that fish would swim around. He had a little bit of a circle. There wasn't much current going on. So he would just swim and he would stick his beak out of the water and he would pluck a mahogany dun off the surface like he was eating an apple, taking it from the tree. And he'd swim over and he'd do that. And I watched for about 10 minutes and finally took this picture and then I finally threw my mahogany dun and it landed somewhere in the vicinity of this. And I just waited. And I could just see him moving around and he finally got to my mahogany dun and he sucked it right off the film. And I thought that was cool as heck. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. The essence of this sport, and this is where it begins a little bit different, you know, catching fish. I mean, gosh, if you want to catch fish, I don't know if fly fishing is the most efficient. You know, nets were great. You know, explosives, piece of cake. I mean, that's a good way to do it. I don't know about power bait, but apparently that works pretty well. But in, in fly fishing, and this is the line in the sand that really takes place, I mean, we're understanding why. I knew exactly why that fish took my fly. I have no clue why fish eat garlic flavored marshmallows. I mean, I just don't know where that came from. They do, but, but I can't answer why. This I can answer. This is the line in the sand, guys. This is the, the essence of what it's all about. And it's an old sport. How old do you think fly fishing is? When's the first, when was the first person, no, maybe not the first person to fly, when was the first writings of somebody fly fishing? What, what century? That helps a little bit. You want to take a shot? 18, yeah, no. a little earlier than that. 16, fifth century, Eight, yep. fifth century AD. And it was this group in, 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 in former Macedonia, and for, you should be pulling out the cots and the beds by now. Former Macedonia, for, or, or Macedonia, former Yugoslavia. My wife is from that region and actually I've fished quite a bit of that. I haven't been in Macedonia yet, but I feel like I'm stepping back in time when I'm, when I'm doing that over there, a spectacular country for it. But this, this group was, this group were, were being talked about by a Roman philosopher, and, and they were catching fish with, with a fly. They didn't have graphite fly rods. They, they didn't have monofilament 
fly lines, monofilament leaders. There, there was no machine reels, right? They didn't have waders, but they were fly fishing. And the essence of it is they created a fly that would imitate an aquatic moth. We call it a caddis, an aquatic moth. That's what started the gig. That's what sent us down this path. It's an, it's an interesting way. And it, what, the, what they were talking about in, in the writings where these fish would come up and feed. I mean, they were down there harvesting fish. They, they, were, they were harvesting fish to eat. And, and these, these fish were rising to a caddis on the surface. And they built a fly to imitate that. My gut tells me the first thing they tried to do was actually attach the caddis to the hook, right? And they didn't call them a hook back then, they called them angles. They were just a sharp piece of iron that was an angle. And people who use those are referred to as... That's where it came from, right? Name the shop right there. I read that, I'm like, that's my name. Okay, anyway. So they created that. They, they, they probably did. I mean, have we ever threaded a grasshopper on a hook? Right? I mean, that would have been an easy one to do. But they couldn't do it. It was too fragile. So they used wool. They were using wool to make their clothes. They used wool yarn and, and a couple of chicken feathers and just a really simple pattern. And it worked. The fish the, fooled by that. And so that's where it's simple, right? I mean, we can all appreciate that. Put bug, uh, fish eat bug, imitate bug, fish eat bug, right? I mean, that's, we, can, we can make that. There's just a lot of variables to it. So this is the slippery slope you're going to go down. You're going to get yourself in a position where you may be on the water and, you, and you'll find fish r rising. A and you'll open up your fly box and you'll start trying different things. And oh my God, this happens, I'm telling you. And they'll come up and sometimes they'll look at your fly and go, no, I'm not going to eat that. Drives me nuts. I take offense to that. I've done my homework. They haven't eaten my fly, right? And you're going to get to the point where that's going to either do two things to you. You're going to say, freaking fly fishing, for, forget this. Go find a, another fish to go get. Or that is going to just sit on you. We had a guy, God, this was a number of years ago, came in the shop. I've never seen him since. And this was probably 20 years ago. I think he was an out-of-towner. But he, he, yeah, it was the first fly shop that he came to. He walked in. His, he was wearing neoprene waders. His, he had felt boots. His f boots were still wet. I saw the footprints coming in. He, he, comes up to the, he comes up to the counter. He opens up a fly book. He goes, what the hell is this? And he had about four or five PMDs, a, a mayfly. And I said, well, they're these. And this is what we'd use them. And this is what you want to add. And he was like, give me some of those. I think he went back to the river. I think he, drew, I think he was on the Hawaii River. I couldn't even get that. He was in such a hurry. That's an hour and a half away from Boise. I think he was speeding. <laughs> Right? His waiting boots were still wet. He was furious. I guess that's the other aspect about fly fishing that I like a lot too. Because you get, a, you get all sorts of emotions. Right? You can go from, oh, I'm feeling pretty good, to I'm frustrated as all hell in 3.2 seconds. Right? This is the exciting part of it. So, and it all revolves around the insects. It all nah their food source. And so the mindset that we need to be in as we move forward with this is what am I going to use based on what's available for the fish to feed on? Yeah, you can twist things and have fun and, and have attractor patterns, but at the end of the day, when you really get into something that's extremely memorable, you're like, man, I got this. It usually has to do with a food source that the fish are greedily feeding on. And you have the right imitation of that. Being at the right place at the right time with the right fly. Magic. Magic. So next week, uh, Chris Gerano is boring the ladies right now with his entomology class. I doubt it. Although I haven't heard a lot of laughter down there. You guys get him next week. He's going to dive into this topic. But I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be doing any favors if I didn't kind of prime the pump a little bit and see if we can stump them. So we're going to try that tonight. All right. So what to use? What do fish feed on? They feed on each other, right? They feed on mice. They feed on scuds. They feed on leeches. Uh, yeah, they do. Sculpin. We have tons of sculpin on the Boise River. 
crayfish. If I was a trout, I think I would eat scuds and crayfish because I like seafood, right? Maybe that, maybe not so much the leeches. They also like to eat terrestrial insects. Ants, we know what an ant is, right? Grasshoppers, bees, bees. Oh, seriously, bees. I don't know how many years ago this was, but one of my, uh, one of my employees, Ryan Spillers, <laughs> was over on the Hawaii River and he, he noticed that somebody had dumped a handful of beehives along the corridor. There's probably four or five clumps of beehives up there. And so he was down fishing and he, he saw a fish come up and eat a bee. So he came back to the shop and he tied his signature fly, the bumble butt, and a bee pattern. And we slam fished that year on that. Incredible. He sold the pattern to Umpqua, and I think he gets royalty checks of around 500 to 1,000 bucks a year on the bumble butt. So if whatever you're doing isn't paying off, become a fly designer. Apparently that pays. <laughs> I haven't made it work, but it worked for Ryan. But they'll eat them. But the, the, the note of that is that he, he noticed something that most people didn't. Tied something to represent it. And then that, I'm telling you, that summer we just trashed them. We were making our own bodies. We couldn't get enough of them. It was incredible. We tie a lot of flies in the shop. I could give a rip about the, 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 the life cycle of a beetle. I just don't care. Ask me, don't care. I don't care what it does. It's a terrestrial insect. Fish are not leaving the water to eat on a grub, a, a beetle grub. The only thing they're going to be interested in is if that beetle's in the willows and the wind knocks it into the water, then they'll eat it. That's when I care. I'm only interested in the terrestrial insects as they're adult, when they're available to the trout, right? But we also have a handful of aquatic insects, and this is really what makes up the bulk of the trout's diet. And it's, it's these five insects, and really it's really four insects. I, I add damsels. Be because damsels eat mosquitoes and I hate mosquitoes, so they determine they deserve a place on my slideshow. Uh, fish eat them too, but they eat a lot more mosquitoes than fish eat them. But these, you're going to need to make physical, and make a mental imprint of these. This is what's going to be talked about next week. And, and, and recognize that these are the adult of these various insects, but there's a there's an entire lifespan underneath the water. These are aquatic insects. They spend most of their time underneath the water and the fish will feed on them throughout the course of the year when they make them available. And that hatch that takes place, you're gonna see an incredible array of, of fly patterns that we tie to imitate that entire process. And you'll have to have a portion of that or at least an understanding of that, what goes on with those hatches that you're able to take advantage of those opportunities when they come up, all right? That makes sense? So, king, aquatic moth, caddis, right? It's a moth. You see a bunch of moths flying around? That's caddis. Stoneflies, best described as a flying cockroach, right? Nasty looking things. Great bugs, fish dig them. About 1,900 species of stoneflies in the United States. We're only interested in about four or five of them. Most of them are small and insignificant, come off in the winter months. But there's a few of them that are real important to us. Midges, kissing cousin to a mosquito, but they don't bite us. Incredibly important food source for the trout, especially in the winter months. And the king of all kings when it comes to mayflies or, or, or aquatic insects are mayflies. Nothing looks like this. It looks like a sailboat an incredibly unique insect. For the, for the angler, the way the fish feed on these insects, the hatches that take place, the consistency of that, we love them. If you call the shop and you're like, hey, listen, John, I'm going to the, to, to the, to the South Fork, what's hatching right now? If there's a mayfly hatch, that's the first thing we're gonna tell you about. We just learn to love that mayfly hatch, all right? So understand those, understand, take a mental imprint of those, and, and, and Chris Toronto next week is going to give you a much more detailed look of that. Um, but we can, um, we can, um, don't click on it just yet. We can kind of get started on that a little bit. Um,
this is a, a trico spinner fall. Trichos are a mayfly that, that hatch out and that hatch out actually at night. I'm a dedicated fly fisherman, but two o'clock in the morning, I'm not fishing Silver Creek. The insects hatch out, they go to the trees, they'll molt one more time, and then they're gonna return to mate. The whole reason these insects hatch out to begin with is for propagation purposes only. And mayflies, they only live a couple of days. Stoneflies, caddis um, will live a little bit longer. Midges have a very short lifespan too as well. So they come back, they'll mate, the females come down, they'll lay their eggs, and then they die. In this video, this is that last part of the mayfly cycle, which is they're going to lay eggs. I've been fishing this hatch since 1993 up at Silver Creek. It was one of the first big hatches that I've ever experienced. Vivid in my mind, loved it. And I've been trying to catch that hatch every year. I don't always make it up there, but just about every year I go up there and at least fish it once, if not multiple times. I've been fishing the same piece of water at the same time, the July, end of July time frame, for 25 years. I've caught generations of fish in these same runs. Every year this hatch takes place, so far. I, I have it on my calendar, I've got it embedded in my mind. I can tell, I, maybe a sixth sense that have started to develop, I can tell when the hatch is just about ready to start based on the temperatures and what's going on around us. That's how consistent things are. That's a beautiful thing about these hatches, that's a beautiful thing about Mother Nature, is it repeats itself. And so once you start to experience these insects, you can bank on the fact that it'll probably take place next year. You can start to make a calendar of when these things take place. And I get nervous when the trichos start going and I can't get up there because I just know it's going to happen. So in this particular area, and I just love this. I'm there about 7 o'clock in the morning. It's beautiful up there. I just like to be there. The first insects don't show up to about 7.45. Once the sun is on the water on this particular run, you can go ahead and run that video. And these fish will move out of their holding water and into these feeding lanes. And this is 20 minutes, maybe a half hour before the first trichos even sit on the water. Then the insects show up. And then the fish start eating. And this takes place maybe two to three hours. And it will go for about a six week period of time with few exceptions. They get so focused on feeding that these are all fish rising this fish does a cartwheel over the top of them. Nobody stops feeding. They're like Joe's hook, keep eating, right? A magnificent area, small little stretch. This is that spring creek I was talking about. I never leave this little spot, this is all I need. There's a pile of fish going. And you have a two to three hour window where you'll see that take place. As soon as the wind starts to come up and it's usually about 11 o'clock, the remainder of those trichos get blown off and immediately the fish stop feeding, and you can see them moving from the feeding lane back into their holding lines where it's deeper along the edge. That's an important date for me to know. Oh, God bless, I wish I was there right now, Kelly. I mean, let's get going here. And the essence of all of that is just really that you, you understanding when these take place, being at those at the right place at the right time to experience that type of an exper that, that type of a hatch, and it stays with you. It stays with you. All right. My daughter was in second grade. She came home uh, from school and visiting with her, and and just asking her about what she had learned in school. And we got to the science part, and she goes, "We're learning about insects." And she goes, you know, there's the incomplete life-cycled insects and the complete life-cycled insects. I just love this conversation. I said, sweetheart, let's go look for them. So I ran down to the shop, got a pair of waders for her and I, and we went right down to the Boise. We started flipping rocks, and we were pulling up nymphs and grubs and, and larvae and, and looking for adults. And my daughter, when, I was in, when she was in second grade, she was looking at her dad like, he's the smartest guy ever. He knows everything. 
And she realized when she was working on calculus in high school that dad wasn't as smart as he thought. <laughs> so, if a second grader can pick that, we got this, guys. And, and again, it's just a matter of understanding the life cycles and being able to identify them to some degree and, and, and then being able to recognize what you have in your fly box that may go back and correspond with what you have. And, and the trout are usually going to give you some benefits of the doubt on this. So this is going to just prime the pump for next week when Chris comes in and really dives into this. But we're going to divide it in two different categories, complete life-cycled insects and, uh, and incomplete life-cycled insects. Mayflies and stoneflies are incomplete life-cycled insects. So eggs are dropped. For six months out of its life, we can't even see what that, that nymph looks like. They're referred to as instars, and they're, with a naked eye, we can't even see them. Last six months, we'll be able to start to identify them, pick them up. And they're six legs, little nymphs. They're going to develop into an adult insect at the time, and they never change their look. They're going to remain that look. They're going to develop into a the right insects. And when the, when the temperature is right, when the time of year is right, we good? When the time of year is right, they're going to leave their underwater world. A gas bubble builds underneath their exoskeleton, and that allows them some flotation so it can aid them. It also glistens in the water. And you'll notice that a lot of nymphs that we have in the fly shop will have a lot of sparkle to them. I think this is Mother Nature's way of telling dumb trout what to feed on. It's shiny, right? It blings a little bit. And then they'll come up to the surface. They're going to break out of their exoskeleton. And we refer to that as an emerger. And that emerging stage is everything to us. You ask a, an entomologist who studies this stuff about this, he doesn't really care. I mean, he's more interested in how many are in there and, and the diversity of it, the intensities of, these ha of the numbers. Mergers, that's what we live for. And not just one, but all of his buddies, right? And as those insects leave that underwater world and they'll make their way up to the surface film, that's when fish become very engaged on feeding on them. They're going to they're gonna break out of their exoskeleton. takes a little while. They're going to inflate their wings. They've got to sit on the surface for just a little bit of time, and then they'll fly off. A day or two later, they'll be, have molted one more time. They'll come back, lay their eggs, and then they die. We refer to that second part of it as a spinner. The first part of it is a done. Sub amigo, amigo. Done. All right? By looking at the insects themselves, you're going to be able to determine what they are. And this is in live from the nymphs themselves to that emerging stage. I love that photograph, right? You can almost see that, that glistening. And you can also see the reflection up on top. That's that, that mirror kind of thing. This is when they're most vulnerable. Those insects will clip and they have to break through that surface film. And it's a little challenging for these small bugs to do that. They'll eventually turn into an adun and then come back and lay their eggs and they'll go totally flat. That's the life cycle. That's the life cycle. And we've got names for these mayflies, the different kinds that are out there, like pale morning duns. When do you think those hatch out? Afternoon. No. Right? Pale morning duns. Blue-winged olive. What color is that? blue wing, olive body. March browns. I mean, that tells you when you should fish them. Right? We do get a little bit of Latin in there. We do speak a little bit of Latin in the shop. Chris does all the time. But he, you know, he was around when they came up with the language. Um, God, that was low. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, that was mean. <laughs> You're going to edit that one out? Um, but you don't have to. But no calabatus, that's not too bad. Betus, we, we talk about those a little bit. Right? You're going to hear all these names. You're going to hear them over and over and again. And, when I, and my, my gut tells me that when you, when you, when you, when you, you get on the South Fork this, this year and you, and you see this epic betas hatch, these blue-winged olives is the layman's term, you're going to remember that. That's going to stick with you because you're going to see tons of fish rise into them and you're going to see all of these insects, all these little sailboats on the water. And that's going to make a lasting imprint on it. And you're going to have that and you're going to duplicate that the following years too. Right? So that's that full mayfly cycle. Stoneflies. 
This we go from egg, we've got our nymph, but we don't see any kind of emerging pattern here. And stoneflies crawl out of the water to, lay, to, to break out of their exoskeleton. They say, the heck with that mid-emergent stuff, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to crawl out. And so they do. So the emergence actually takes place several weeks before the first insects start to show up as these insects are starting to crawl towards the shorelines. And if you're fishing in waters that have a fair amount of current to them, those insects will oftentimes get washed downstream. And you talk about an easy meal, right? Some of the largest part of these stone flies are going to be up to a couple of inches long, maybe three inches long. Those are the big salmon flies. You can see that, how they crawl out. This is kind of cool to watch, but if you're seeing that, it's time to be fishing, not watching insects crawl out of their exoskeleton. These are the nymphs, and they are really that wicked looking. The golden stones are just phenomenal. We got squalas. You're going to hear that name come up a little bit, especially as you start to get into this squala. It's a stone fly that's starting to come off, soon to come off on the Hawaii River in Oregon. Um, and then we've got the big Terranarsis californicas, yellow sallies. But they're huge. Creepy when they land. Oh, God, they are. God, Kelly, they are. And this is mean of me, and I, but I can't help myself. But there's so many times I've taken friends and family down the at South Fork of the Boise when this hatch is going on. South Fork has a, has a really good salmon fly hatch. In fact, if you've ever worked with anybody who has a drift boat and likes to fly fish, in the June time frame, you, you'll notice they're always sick. It's called the South Fork Flu, and that's exactly when this or spawns, when this hatch comes off. Anyway, um, this is mean, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll row them down, and I'll just drop by the, by the bank and get out, maybe act like I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I'll grab some of the insects. And then when they're not looking, I'll, I'll place them on their shoulder, and there's a very distinctive scream, doesn't matter male or female, when it finally crawls over the, yeah, it's good stuff. You gotta entertain yourself when you're rowing the boat. <clears throat> um, but it, it, an important insect for the, for, the, for, the, for the most part at very specific times of the year in specific locations. Not every place has got this. The, the stonefly population in the Boise River in town is pathetic. The Hawaii River, uh, a couple of them kind of. Places like the South Fork of the Boise, the Middle Fork, they have much better stonefly. So based on where you're at, you're gonna end up having to need these or, or not, okay? Incomplete life cycle insects. Dams are, are an incomplete life cycle insect. I love this bug. Fearless, they're predators. They're feeding on, when, when, when hatches are taking place and still, they thrive in still water bodies, they're, they're dragonflies. Is what, they're just dragonflies. They're, they're incredible predators and they're out feeding on other insects when other trout are feeding on those insects and they start feeding on these other guys. When it's time for them to hatch, they just throw caution to wind, heck with it, and they do this suicidal swim to the shoreline. You'll see them. If you're out there in a float tube and you're fishing a little bit, you're an island, they're gonna, ha they're gonna hatch out on you, but you'll see them just swimming right underneath the surface, heading to the bank. Must be temperature that, that drives them one direction or another. How many of them go the opposite direction and they're having to run out of energy before they get to the lane? And then they get to the shorelines, they'll crawl out and that's where they'll hatch out. Fish gobble them, birds gobble of them. Those that make it will eat all the mosquitoes we need to. In the water, Camouflage is what drives, uh, it, what drives the colorations to it. So if, if you, if, and it sometimes can be just brilliant. The damsels at Henry's Lake are, are almost chartreuse. They're so green, brilliant green. And we go down to the reservation, they're almost like a dirty olive. Um, so based on where you're at, it's going to taste on the, the coloration of them. The hatching takes place out on the water, and then the, the adults will live several months um, and then eventually come back, lay their eggs, and the females will crawl down a, uh, a weed a stem and lay their eggs, make little slits in the weed beds and in the stems, and then lay their eggs in the, in the stems. Interesting insect, and the fish will feed on that a little bit as well. But they eat a lot of mosquitoes. When we get into the caddis and when we get into the, the midges, these are gonna be complete life-cycled insects. So there's gonna be one more step to that whole process. So we go from egg, and from egg, they're gonna develop into what we refer to as a, as a larva. Many of these insects are gonna end up building homes. And if you've, 
gosh, if you want to just go down to the Boise River and you start flipping a few rocks over, you can actually see little pebbles stuck to the bottom of these rocks. Those are caddis homes. Now, now trout aren't flipping them over and scraping them off and eating them, but, but this is, that's where they live. I had watched this wonderful documentary on caddis. We get a little bit geeky. This is an insect to get geeky about. But they will build nets um, or webs, if you will, in between rocks on the bottom of the river, and they're actually saning particles out of the river and feeding on them. It's just phenomenal to me. And this one documentary said there's, in healthy rivers that have an abundance of caddis, it's the caddis webbing between all the rocks that are really holding those rocks down from the currents. That's what holds them in place. It's phenomenal what those insects do. Um, when it's time to hatch, several weeks before, it's like a caterpillar going into a cocoon. And then two weeks later, it's going to pop out a butterfly. In this case, it still has to make that emergence through the water column, and it's going to transform and then eventually get into hatch out as an adult. And so they're, 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 the casing that you're going to see are made out of stones. They're going to be made out of vegetation. Depends on what kind of insect you're looking at. We have a few f grubbing things. This is where I think most horror movies have picked up on their idea of aliens. Right? I mean, they're just nasty looking bugs. And then eventually we get into that adult caddis. Complete life cycle all the way through. There was a, there was a jewelry company, company in Japan that um, were using October caddis, these bigger ones. And they would put them into an aquarium with uh, gold and gems, jewels. And the caddis would make their homes out of those rare metals and, and uh, rare stones emerge out and then they would seal those and then sell those for earrings. I thought that was interesting. Kind of cool looking. All right, caddis. And then the last one, midges. And you're gonna learn to hate this freaking bug. And, and, and the reason being, they're so small. This is the question we get. I mean, can you catch a big fish on a fly you can barely see? And the answer is yes, but it's challenging. Midges are so important to the trout's diet, though, because in, in many of our areas, it's the only consistent food source year-round. And so this time of year, we're throwing midges. It's the only hatch taking place. We'll have three to four generations of midges in one year, um, and so there's always something coming off. Uh, the eggs are laid, they sink to the bottom, the grubs bury the eggs, the grubs bury down in the muck, fish never see them, then it's time for the emergence to take place, they'll swim up to the bottom, they're pretty good little swimmers for as small as they are, break out of their exoskeleton, and then they'll buzz around on the surface for a while. This is where fish feed on them. This is where fish feed on them. And this is really much what they look like. Little worms, grubs if you will, that emergence, again you can see that that window, that mirror very easily, that, um, that emergence takes place, and then the adults just look like a little mosquito, okay? Easy, piece of cake. We're gonna have a test before you leave. Gotta get them all right before we go. You're gonna hear all this again. And it's really the essence of these insects that are gonna drive everything. Go back to that video real quickly. And I just, I just like this idea of it, but, and I'm not a romantic when it comes to fly fishing. We had enough books in romantic. This is practicality. But the one thing I like about that is I'm on the water 45 minutes before the first insect comes out of the trees. And I'm, I'm, I'm physically watching fish move from holding water to their feeding lane, waiting for the exact same insect. We're just all waiting around for that bug. They are completely ingrained to that food source. They've probably, the hatch took place a couple weeks before I got up there. They are completely tuned in to when that food, food source is gonna be available to them. They're waiting, they know what's coming. For two weeks in a row, every morning, they've been able to feed on that bug. And when it comes to this part of it, being at the right place at the right time makes a big difference. And that video that did not show that, at the end of the day, about 11 o'clock, the wind came up, and I was hearing some voices coming up the river. 
and um, a couple guys coming up and they were carrying float tubes and it's real common to float through that stretch of river with a float tube and then pick off fish and uh, they walked by and they were they were less than thrilled to see me i was there because i think that's where they wanted to kind of zero in on but wave they walked upstream and it just so happened that the wind started to come up at the time they just passed me and you know all the insects were going everything's going so i took the camera clip down knew where they were going to go so i did the gentleman thing to do and i walked downstream about 50 to 100 yards and crossed the river so i could stay away from what they were going to do that's a polite thing to do got on the trail and as i was walking back up by the time i got to where i was fishing from the other side of the river they were there nymphing away i'm sure they had a great day wave to them good luck guys have a great time and as i pass i'm just thinking Really, was that extra cup of coffee that important, right? I mean, did you have to stop for breakfast? I mean, they, they missed it. They, they missed that magical two hour, three hour window of this phenomenal feeding activity because they were worried about getting their gear up there or something. And I don't want you to, I don't want you to do that. I mean, this, this whole concept when it comes to this part of it is, is really trying to put yourself at the right place at the right time. We will help you any way we possibly can. You are not alone. I mean, God bless it. We're here. You got three great fly shops in town. Um, come in and see us. Visit with us. If you have friends that you're fishing with, this is a topic of conversation to have before you go. Think of yourself slightly as detectives. And before the trip, not months before the trip, you can kind of get a sense, maybe a month before, but a but few days before you go, start to gain that information. Make sure your fly box is in order. If you're brand new at it, you never walk into a fly shop without your fly box. Bring it in. I mean, we're not going to say, no, none of these are going to work. You have to buy all of our stuff and sell you the same thing. No, we're not, that's not how we roll in this place. We're going to go through and say, you have this. We may have to supplement a few in, and we'll remind you of what you have and what, how you should fish it. We'll open up Google Earth. We'll, we'll look at spots and say, this is the kind of, whether it's still water or rivers, in our area within 100 miles, it's not like we haven't fished it. We can give you some insights. Do that detective work ahead of time so that when you get there and you're on the water, you're not going, okay, now what do I do? right? What do I do now? It's, you have a game plan, you have some strategies. As you go through the next, and I hope everybody goes through every one of these things, this is, a, this is an undertaking. Preston, Keith, Steve, you guys have done, and Becky, your star, right on the top of the list. <laughs> this is an incredible source of information for the next few weeks. Take advantage of this. And everybody is going to approach this differently. And you're going to talk, every one of these topics you're going to talk about it, whether it's high mountain lakes, he's just talking to you about the place to go. Macro look at it. McCall, all of these lakes that are available. These are the flies that you want to fish with. These are the times of year that you want to be on. That way you've got a good game plan. When you, when you think about doing this, you've got a little bit of a game plan. You know where to go and what to use. All right? And ask questions and be inquisitive. The, 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 the most important piece of equipment you have is your, your brain. I mean, you've got to think this stuff through. And we'll help with all the fill-in spots, but the mindset should be is where am I going and what am I using? That makes sense? Just beat this in. I'm just going to beat this in. Okay. Uh, Don Connor's going to do the equipment thing. He may argue with this, but... But I, I, I do this for every one of my classes. Absolutely every one of my classes. The most important piece of equipment. I did this for, um, I did a little program for my, when my, my son was at, at, at school. We fished the kids down at, at the Boise River and I did this. And this is a major important. What's the most important piece of equipment? Chris Preston's going to take you fishing if you get it right. Boy. What? Oh, you've seen this. Oh, my foot. Oh, my foot. <laughs> Why sunglasses? 
All right, this is a little gory, guys. Yeah. All right. Hey, the only way you can really hurt yourself is the hook in the eye. This poor guy was just got done with his high school. It was his high school trip. He was on the middle fork of the salmon two days into the float. Walked by and somebody hooked his eye. Saved the eye. Messed up the trip a little bit. Wear sunglasses. Not only for, for protection, but uh, if you get the polarized versions of it, you can actually start to see down in the water as well, and that really helps as well. But make sure you got a piece of sunglasses. Obviously, a rod, reel, line, boots, thousands of dollars in flies, come see us, is going to be important. <laughs> but, but none of that is going to be as important as making sure you got some safety glasses on. All right. How's that for an introduction? You guys ready for this? We have any questions? Boy, will you. Boy, will you. Take notes. Um, in, the, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the shop, we do these, these classes, and we get to this part of it, and I used to hand out journals. When I started fly fishing at 10, 11 years old, the fly shops were a little more cliquish than they are now, and um, I used to go into Rocky Mountain Anglers, and Gary didn't have much use for a 10-year-old punk kid looking for some dubbing, but uh, Glenn finally took a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of interest in, in, in myself and my older brother, and we were able to ask the questions and stuff, but it was still, there wasn't much. And we weren't, didn't have wheels, and we weren't going, we were just fishing the Boise. Um, so it, somebody took me on to a journal. And so uh, I was a horrible student, had no interest in, in a lot of that stuff, but I kept a great journal, fly fishing journal and making notes of the temperatures, the temperature of the water, what insects I saw, and I made all these little different notes. I was much better in college than I was in high school, but making those notes and understanding that, great way of doing that. And so I was doing one of these classes, I hand out this journal, uh, blank journal entries, and one of the 11 year old kids across the counter from, table from me was like, seriously, I've got to do homework fishing? <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> All right. Thank you.